Hello and welcome to this presentation on the nature of science. And you're probably thinking to yourself, my gosh, do we have to talk about this again? Well, yes we do. We do have to talk about this stuff again. It's important. Every year I run into misconceptions and this year will be no different. So let's get into it. The scientific method is not an example of, of, of something that where scientists go and apply for grants and somebody, somebody offers them money and they say, well, your science has to look like this when you're done in order to get this money. That's not the case. The scientific method is a, a model whereby, or a process whereby we conduct experiments and, and try to look for an answer, try to understand the natural world. And here's a good example of that. We define the problem, form hypotheses, make observations and test them, and then we decide whether our hypotheses were correct or not. We can use this flow chart to help with that. If they were, then we draw a conclusion and we communi communicate the results. And you're going to see that you're going to read some of those papers that scientists have written this year. But this is the basic experimental method. <clears throat> is, that all, is that exactly how it works all the time? No, it's a model. Some science occurs through accidents. And some is purely observational. We don't do experiments in a lab necessarily. An example of a science that occurs uh, through accidents is hominid evolution. You know, sometimes a new skull or a new skeleton comes comes to light in Old Divide Gorge in Africa that wasn't known before. And it's a, it's an, it's, it's a surprise, and we have to reassess our entire, um, you know, based on its, it, uh, its shape and various parameters, we have to reassess our entire understanding of human evolution. That's sometimes the way it works. So it's not always that model that you've learned all your life. Sometimes things happen by accident, and sometimes we don't conduct experiments, we just observe in the field. And in geology and astronomy, observation is very important, not so much experimentation. Philosophically, though, it's difficult for scientists to, to really get a good handle on the, on the philosophy of science. Uh, Richard Feynman famously said that it's the philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. Ornithology is the study of birds, if you're not familiar with that. But it's likely that ornithological knowledge would be of great benefit to birds, you know, how we classify them and so forth. Be great if they knew how they were classified by humans, perhaps, and it might help them with certain things, perhaps. I don't know. Um, were it possible for them to possess it? In other words, the philosophy of science would be great to scientists. Would it be, were it possible for a scientist to actually possess that philosophy? <laughs> well, we try, but we don't always succeed. Because we have to understand that believing something is not easy. Knowledge is a difficult thing to lay your, to lay your hand on, because knowledge has two important things. You can think something is true, which is belief, okay? But those beliefs can be mistaken. Bob walks on a bridge and believes it's safe. Everyone joins him, the bridge collapses. His belief was wrong. What was he missing? Facts, truth, empirical understanding and knowledge. So the other side of this is truth. Knowledge can't contradict itself. Bob believes the bridge is safe, but Jenny doesn't believe it is because she's done some studies, some engineering studies and whatnot, and, but they can't simultaneously know it's safe and unsafe. A good example of this in the public eye is, of course, the age of the Earth. Many of you are familiar with the idea that the Earth is, the idea that's pervaded by, by some, that the Earth is very young, whereas 6,000 years or so, whereas the, the entire scientific community understands the Earth to be 4.5 billion years old. Well, n both of these cannot be true. So one or the other has to be wrong. And that's what the search for, of truth is all about in science, uh, is looking for facts to support one idea or the other. Now, you don't necessarily start with an idea unless it's your hypothesis. So this leads us to Socrates, good old, the good old Greek philosopher Socrates. You can imagine sitting on a rock in the Agora once upon a time um, in, in ancient Athens and these guys just sitting around philosophizing and arguing about things. And di Plato wrote a bunch of dialogues. One of these was his dialogue Theit Theit ah, excuse me, Theaetetus, which is one I'll, I'll uh, get a copy for you and, and you, know, you can read if you want. Um, where he described what justified true belief was. In other words, that if Bob believes the bridge is safe, he better have good reason to support it with facts and knowledge. So knowledge requires both truth and belief to be knowledge. Here's Socrates for you. All right, this is a nice little Venn diagram. There's lots of truths out there that people don't believe. The economy's bad, the politicians don't necessarily believe it, or at least they act like they don't believe it because they don't do anything about it. And we all suffer and go into more debt and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things people believe that just aren't true. 
aliens have never visited the Earth. At least there's no, not, there's, no, there's no facts to support it. So belief with no truth. Where those two intersect is where we want to be in science. That's where knowledge lies, true knowledge. So this is an important concept that you will be responsible for knowing. Now, some important things to keep in mind. Empiricism, that's a big word. Basically, it just means we want physical evidence. We want facts. Okay, empirical evidence is factual evidence. It's the stuff you gather in laboratories or through observation. Okay, theories of knowledge emphasize experience. We have to have facts to have truth. And then the truth then supports our belief, which then leads to knowledge. Now, there is this idea of relativism out there where no objective truth can be discovered. This is not the case for the most part in science. We're looking for objective or absolute truth about something, not relativistic truth. Because we don't necessarily believe that what is true for one person is true for somebody else, is different for somebody else. Um, you know, red stars are the same, temp are one temperature for, uh, red supergiants are one temperature for this guy over here in Maine. And they're a different temperature for that guy over there in India. That's not true. Red supergiants are, are generally, a, uh, generally one temperature, one temperature range. Okay, but they can't be they can't be two different things for two different people. That's relativism. Absolutism is knowing that that red supergiant star is the same temperature no matter where you are on the Earth, no matter who you are, no matter how you measure it. That is absolute objective truth. And this is the idea that it can be determined is absolutism. That's what we're after in science. Three other things, three other important words. Science must be testable. You have to be able to test it. If you can't test it, it's not science. Um, you can't test the existence of God, for instance. At least we don't have way, a way at this point. So therefore, you can't call that science. You have to call it, you call it faith. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't call it science. It has to be falsifiable. You have to be able to prove that idea wrong, which I know for for many people, that's kind of a scary idea. You have an idea you want to hold on to. You, you, you love that idea, but you don't want to be able to believe that it's, that, that it's, pro that it's possible to prove it wrong. Well, you, that's important for science. It also has to be reproducible. An experiment that I do has to be reproducible with the same results, roughly, um, that somebody else does someplace, some other place. Those are all Karl Popper's ideas. So we're looking, we're looking for objectivity, not subjectivity. We want to get rid of bias that nasty word bias that we're all prone to use. So, and then within science, we also have levels of understanding. Hypotheses are just simple ideas we kind of make up and we toss out. We don't, it's not really that big of a deal. Theories in science, though, are much bigger than just the word theory that we throw out all the time. Theories in science are sets of ideas supported by empirical data that describe some observable set of observations and then are confirmed with multiple experiments over a range of phenomena and useful for prediction and testing. There's three key things there. Supported by empirical data, confirmed with multiple experiments over a range of phenomena, and useful for prediction and testing. Theories in science are a big deal and you can't just throw them out, which is why evolution doesn't just get thrown out by scientists because it's too well supported. It is essentially, in, in the mind of 95% of scientists, become law. Now you can't necessarily come call evolution law specifically because it's not undergirded by mathematical principles. And if we're going to be honest about what a law is, Generally, they're undergirded by mathematical statements. General relativity is undergirded by math. Um, the ideal gas law in chemistry has a mathematical foundation, so on and so forth. Anytime you have a mathematical statement in science, that is describing, generally describing a law. And that is the, the high, that's what we're after. We're after natural laws. We want to understand how the universe works. Now, there's four little comics here. You decide which is pseudoscience in each of these each of these frames and which one is science? The only one is science. Only one is objective, only one is supported by empirical evidence and so forth. Little, you need know, to pause the video here and decide for yourself. All right, valid forms of reasoning include inductive reasoning. That's where you're trying to make broad generalizations um, about uh, a phenomena based on a couple of observations of individual phenomena. I use this example of holding an ice cube in my hand and saying that it's cold, therefore all the ice in the universe is cold. Well, that may be true, um, but it doesn't ensure that the conclusion is true just because I held one ice cube in my hand. Perhaps there's ice cubes out there that are not as, that are not as, uh, as cold. And if we talk about anything solid, it's technically ice, so maybe I should define it as water ice, to be more specific, because 
there's lots of things that are solid that are really hot. <laughs> and if you just describe ice as a solid, you get where I'm getting. You can, maybe you can see where I'm getting at is that you, you know these statements have to be pretty specific if they're going to be really useful necessarily. But inductive reasoning is often used by scientists, and there's nothing wrong with it. You can't always test every phenomenon. The other kind is the old. Well, I'm sorry. Here's an example of bad inductive reasoning. Um, if we were to deport all illegal uh, illegal aliens in this country, not just Mexicans, but we're talking about any Greeks and Germans and other people. I'm not trying to be uh, uh, limiting here. Um, but in this case, if we deported all illegal uh, immigrants from Mexico, um, I'm pretty sure we'd still be able to make burritos. Bad inductive reasoning. All right, other kind is deductive reasoning, where the conclusion is just as certain as the premises, and this is usually for smaller things, like um, you know, it, the street, when it rains, the street gets wet. It's raining, therefore the street is wet. It's a good conclusion to draw. I can go out and test it right away. And I'm talking about a specific street, not all the streets in the world getting wet because it's raining here. That would be bad deductive reasoning. So problematic deductive reasoning, uh, just an example, here's some good reasoning, here's some good reasoning, that's, and you can't connect the two, then you just throw a miracle in there, that's bad deductive reasoning. All right, just a couple of, uh, one little funny thing to leave, leave you with, and one little serious thing to leave you with. Entia non sunt multiplicanda preter necessitatum, which is what William of Ockham said back in the 14th century, that entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. We translate that as the simplest answer is usually the best. This is called Occam's razor. So that's, we, that, that's the kind of thing we like to strive for in science. If you have a bunch of different explanations, try to stick with the simplest. All right, till next time, have a great one.